I'm John Brown, a 16-year law enforcement veteran from the state of Arkansas. The Clinton Chronicles was originally released in June of 1994. The videotape had a very big impact, according to some, on the 1994 election. The Chronicles was put together because there were several people, not only in Arkansas, but across the nation, that had documented evidence of criminal activity that involved Bill and Hillary Clinton. That evidence was never allowed to be in court. The media refused to expose this evidence. The people who prepared this film took the time and the effort to allow the people and the investigators involved to bring the evidence to you, the people, to view. What you're about to see, you're not going to believe. Some of you will say, how could this happen? All I ask you to do, sit back, view what we have, and listen to what we have to say. You make your own judgment. On January 20th, 1993, William Jefferson Clinton became the 42nd President of the United States. At the time, most Americans were not aware of the extent of Clinton's criminal background, nor were they aware of the media blackout, which kept this information from the public. As State Attorney General and later Governor, Bill Clinton in 12 years achieved absolute control over the political, legal, and financial systems of Arkansas. As president, he would attempt to do the same with the nation by bringing members of his inner circle with him to Washington. The hijacking of America was underway, and its impact on future generations would be incalculable. Bill Clinton was born in Hope and, of course, raised in Hot Springs. They had open body houses over there at the time, and they had open gambling at the time. But Clinton grew up in that, in that atmosphere, that different atmosphere of Hot Springs. If it felt good, you did it. He was selected to go to, to the National from Arkansas Boys Day to be a delegate to the National Boys' Day. And while he was there, he was able to meet John Kennedy. And I'm sure that sparked an ambition uh, in this young man. And uh, he apparently has always had an exceptional, a keen mind, a keen intellect. And, and he has, uh, he early, evidently, uh, had tremendous ambition. He, he was gifted in so many ways. The truth is, he's one of the most charming men that I've ever met in my life. He has more energy than, than, than any 10 people I've ever known. He was able to network himself into running for attorney general uh, virtually unopposed. And then he was able to take that position and catapult himself into the governor's office two years later and started building his foundation. When you think about uh, Bill Clinton's aversion to the truth, you wonder uh, if this is because of the lackadaisical moral background that he's had in this area. Uh, he lied about Rhodes being a Rhodes Scholar. He never completed that and still said he was a Rhodes Scholar. He went to Moscow and did business with them uh, against the United States government, and he wasn't challenged by the press about that. In Arkansas, while he was governor, he said he balanced the budget 11 times. He never did it once. 
Also, he said he didn't raise taxes, and he raised taxes 126 times. He can accommodate any situation that comes up because he's not hemmed in with the truth. I've never felt that Clinton, consciously or unconsciously, was hemmed in with morality. I first met Bill Clinton in the mid to late 70s. He was an up-and-coming politician. Uh, there were a group of us, Jim Guy Tucker, uh, Bill Clinton, Sheffield Nelson, and myself. And we kind of ran around and palled around with each other. It was from that point that I did a lot of projects for Bill from a marketing perspective. In 1988, I went to Bill. I said, I need uh, a job to kind of relax, mellow out. Bill Clinton and Betsy Wright, they suggested that I go to work for a place called the Arkansas Development Finance Authority. And they said my talents could really be used there. It was uh, the best kept secret in Arkansas. After about two weeks, I went to Wooten Epps and I said, Wooten, I think I've got enough background on this that we can start marketing it. Now, what is the criteria for loans? He said, whoever Bill wants to get a loan. To go back, though, to that moment in time, I'd been there about a month, and I realized that I was in the epicenter of what I'd always heard about all my life. What most people have heard about is the machine. I was literally working, sitting in the middle of Bill Clinton's political machine. It was where he made payoffs, uh, where he repaid favors to people for campaign support. Uh, I was in an interesting seat, and I knew it. We had a board meeting. Um, in that particular board meeting, I was sitting at the end of the table. James Brannion, who was chairman of the board at that time, was sitting at the head of the table. James Brannion stood up in a public restaurant, and he hollered at uh, the Beverly Enterprises guy, Bobby Stevens, and said, did you get the $50,000 campaign contribution from the client that, you, that you're introducing the loan for. He said, not yet. He said, well, then hold up the loan till we get it. I stood up, went up to James, and I said, James, don't yell stuff like that. You don't need to be yelling it in a restaurant. That sounds real bad. He was just burly and arrogant. He said, who cares? Bill Clinton sold the concept of ADFA to the people of Arkansas as a vehicle for creating jobs and assisting churches and schools. In reality, millions of taxpayer-guaranteed dollars were being channeled to Clinton's election campaigns, to his inner circle of friends, and to his wife Hillary's law firm. This may explain why ADFA had been drafted in such a manner as to keep its decision-making procedures secret. If you needed a million dollars, you had to get your application handled by the Rose Law Firm, pay them $50,000. There were five other companies in the state of Arkansas that were actually more qualified in bond structuring and applications, but Rose Law Firm got them all. I started checking around and I kept asking, well, you know, one thing's bothering me to the comptroller, Bill Wilson, you know, how do people make payments on these loans? He looked at me and said, they don't. He thought I knew. Well, that blew my mind. And this is about two months in and it was getting tough then. So I started gathering the documents. After everybody left, I would stick around as if I were working on the annual report that would give me access to all the documents. And I made copies of them all. For about two months, I watched accounts accumulate money. And then the month they zero balanced. They're laundering drug money. There were a hundred million a month in cocaine coming in and out of Mena, Arkansas. They had a problem. They were doing so much money in cocaine, 100 million. You, you create a problem in a little state like Arkansas. How do you clean $100 million a month? ADFA, until 1989, never banked in Arkansas. What they would do is they would ship the money down to Florida, a bank in Florida, which later would be connected to BCCI. They would ship money to a bank in Atlanta, Georgia, which, by the way, was later connected to BCCI. They'd ship to Citicorp in New York, which would send the money overseas. And there was an interesting one, a bank in Chicago. That bank, by the way, is partially owned by Dan Rostenkowski. 
Dan Lassiter would get the bonds. He would become the broker for the bonds. He would transfer money back to ADFA. He never sold a bond. The money then would leave ADFA, go into one of the various banks for the specific bond loan, and they would zero it out. When they zeroed it out, they were giving it back to Lester, less their handling fees. During the Lester investigation, we had numerous witnesses for the federal grand jury, uh, had extensive uh, testimony. Uh, people that was connected with Laster and drug use and everything else. Uh, his cocaine uh, use become used as a tool for sexual favors and also for uh, uh, business uh, uh, deals that influence people. Uh, and that's when uh, Mr. Laster become quite flamboyant with his cocaine use and then ultimately uh, led to his uh, arrest and conviction. Dan Lassiter, who was the best friend of Bill Clinton, who went to jail with Roger Clinton for cocaine. And by the way, let me explain something. He didn't sell cocaine. No, nope. they were giving it away. Huge piles of cocaine in his office. Ashtray upon ashtray full at the parties, and they would give it to young girls. That's sick. I mean, they were giving a highly addictive drug to young girls. One particular one comes to mind is a 14-year-old cheerleader uh, out of North Little Rock. Uh, she was uh, uh, a virgin, and ultimately he ended up uh, uh, sending her to a physician of his. Uh, the physician put her on birth control pills. Um, he used cocaine in order to, uh, to uh, ultimately she lost her virginity and she got addicted to cocaine. And the last I heard of her, when we had her subpoenaed back to the federal grand jury, uh, she was a hooker in Lake Tahoe. Dan Laster contracted to launder the money. Now, in addition to his contract to launder the money and the system that he and Bill Clinton had set up to do it, probably what he did is he took advantage of some of the cocaine. That's why he could give it away. Shoot, you have 100 million a month in cocaine. They wouldn't care if you took a bucket full a day. After Laster was indicted, I started to uh, uh, receive quite a bit of harassment from, from my own department, the Arkansas State Police. And I knew the reason behind it because uh, the affiliation with the State Police and the governor's office uh, with Dan Laster and his uh, business associates. Mr. Lassiter's Cocaine involvement at times was very heavy, then at times he was very cool, calm, mediocre. He didn't, he was, he was very careful as all of them have been for quite some time. Once he was convicted, he went to a minimum security prison, a holiday hotel we call him. He spent, I think it was six to eight months, and he got out, unbeknownst to anybody. Bill Clinton, the day after he got out, granted him a full and complete pardon. So if you think he's tough on crime, think about a man that pardons a man that gives cocaine to kids. Fear of violence is robbing our children of their future. We must take away that fear and give them hope. We must give Alicia and all our children back their childhood. Working together, we can. Do something now. Call 1-800-WE-PREVENT. Your president, the president of the United States, not only was a part of a system that was laundering millions of cocaine dollars, your president signed off on it. He can't deny that he did. You see, because that, there's one little catch. Every loan at ADPA made, Bill Clinton himself had to sign off on it. More than Bill Clinton. You better identify the people in the loop of the drug running. You better identify the people in the loop for money laundering. And what you'll find there is those people go straight to Washington. Act 1062, if you look at it, it says that ADFA was developed and created to provide low interest bond loans for churches, schools, colleges. So now look what happened to our legislature. They voted on a bill creating ADFA. 
thinking that they were getting money to colleges and schools to buy books and so forth. What better way to run thousands of tens of millions of dollars, launder it, clean it up, and use the cover of a state agency to do it? The first loan made at ADFA was made to Parkometer, a company called Parkometer. Seth Ward was the owner. As I started looking, I found out that the secretary treasurer was Webb Hubble. Then I found out Webb Hubble was Seth Ward's son-in-law. Guess who drafted the legislation creating Act 1062, which created the Arkansas Development Finance Authority? Webb Hubble. Guess who introduced the legislation to our legislators and got it passed through our house? Webb Hubble. Guess who got the first loan? Webb Hubble. Imagine this. Guess who did the audit and the evaluation of the application? Rose Law Firm. You guessed it. Who signed it? Webb Hubble. Hillary Clinton. You see, that's against the law in Arkansas. You can't investigate yourself when the good faith and credit of the state of Arkansas is involved in a bond issue. He broke the law. Good Lord willing, Creek don't rise. Mr. Hubble will be serving some time in the pen for that one. Ironically, Webb Hubble, a senior partner at the Rose Law Firm, was chairman of the Conflicts of Interest Committee at Rose. In 1988, he successfully advanced the Ethics in Government Act, which required Arkansas legislators to report governmental conflicts of interest. Incredibly, this law specifically exempted Governor Bill Clinton, his appointees, and his relatives. Clinton's appointment of Hubble to the U.S. Justice Department exemplified the administration's total disregard for legal ethics. Hubble's hasty resignation in March 1994 for overbilling of Rose clients was merely a ploy to remove Hubble from the limelight before extensive criminal charges could be brought against him. Let me tell you about Park on me. The first loan was $2.85 million. Never was a penny of that paid back. As the newspaper people started inquiring about the Parkometer loans, what they found was that Parkometer was actually building retrofit nose cone compartments that were being shipped to Mena. We find out that the nose cones were actually being used to smuggle dope back into the country. And what is scary, what's so scary, it's the same cast of characters. Webb Hubble, the Rose Law Firm, are guilty, I say to you, of conspiring to defraud the state of Arkansas, the federal government, and conspired to solicit the sales and the laundering of money for illegal drugs. This is your president. This is his circle of power. These are the people, when he got elected president, he did not pass go, he took them straight to Washington with him. And by all things holy, I think he was planning to set up and do the same thing in Washington. In 1982, cocaine trafficker Barry Seal set up one of the largest drug smuggling operations in the United States in Mena, Arkansas, under the approving eye of Governor Bill Clinton. Barry Seal had a bunch of planes and supposedly had pilots. Barry Seal was a, was a drug smuggler. Now, he tried to set it up in his home state of Louisiana, but they wouldn't let him. He had to come to a state that had a sleazy governor hooked on cocaine, and everybody knew it. Yeah, Bill Clinton was hooked on cocaine. I lived in Little Rock, Arkansas, okay? And uh, I worked at a cup called La, Bist La Bistro's, and I met Roger Clinton there, uh, Governor Bill Clinton, um, so a couple of the state troopers that went with him wherever he went, Roger Clinton, uh, had came up to me and he had asked me, could I get him some coke, you know, and ask for my one hitter, which a one hitter is a very small silver device, okay, that you stick up into your nose and you just squeeze it and it, a snort of cocaine and go up in there. And uh, I watched um, Roger hand what I had gave, given him to um, Governor Clinton and he just kind of turned around and 
walked off, and that's one specific. Dr. Suen, uh, S-U-E-N, the uh, doctor at the medical center here in Little Rock, has taken care of Bill Clinton for his sinus problems, which may indeed be drug-related to cocaine use um, as they destroy the sinus passages. Governor Bill Clinton was taken into the hospital, I believe it was the medical center, on at least one or two occasions for cocaine uh, abuse and overdosage in which he actually had to be cared for at the hospital. It led to um, toga parties. Uh, and if you're not sure on what a toga party is, I've had to clarify this in the past. A uh, toga party is where you wrap yourself in a sheet uh, most of the time. Uh, the people at the toga, toga parties were um, Governor Clinton, now President Clinton, Attorney General um, Steve Clark. Okay, he was there a few times. Um, members of the Arkansas State Police, you know, along with Roger and, you know, other people. They began to dance around, do the cocaine in one room, have sex in another room, because in the Coachman's Inn, the rooms were adjoining, you know. And, uh, to be quite truthful, you end up with somebody in particular and you nine times out of ten end up having sex. And uh, there, co there was cocaine there. I, I know. I'm, I'm the one that made sure it was there. Okay, I've talked to the manager, the assistant manager for the apartment complex where Roger Clinton used to live. They've all said Bill Clinton did drugs. They saw him. I've talked to a lot of other people who of all, just like the people at the apartment complex, said, hey, John, get us to a congressional hearing. Yes, we'll sign sworn affidavits. Uh, these people want to be sure when they come forward that something's done about it because they fear for their life, but they really want the truth to get out. I was there, we're coming there with Roger one night, and back in the um, back part of the mansion there, there's kind of like a living quarters type thing, and uh, we would all get together out there and um, do cocaine, you know. And uh, no, Miss Clinton wasn't there at the time. In uh, 1983, I was made aware that Sheriff Hadaway and one of his auxiliary deputies, Terry Capehart, were investigating a, uh, a smuggling operation going on at the Vienna Airport. They had a, an inside source of information. Mr. Seal, um, it was our understanding, was the one who had brought the operation into the main airport and that had initiated the beginning of the money laundering and the illegal activity. He said 1983 was his most profitable cocaine smuggling period ever. He uh, said that he, uh, the airplanes that he had placed at the main airport, there were four of them, a couple of Senecas and a couple of Panthers and one or two stragglers uh, here and there, different airplanes. He said they were uh, purchased solely for the purpose of cocaine smuggling. There was, in my opinion, more than enough evidence to prosecute a number of people for crimes regarding the Barry Seal case at Mena. I snuck around, crawled through the bushes, thinking that I'd really have to hide to see them unloading the dope. Didn't have to. You could walk right up to the airport and they'd unload it right in front of you. They would unload it, they'd offload it. They didn't care. A uh, certain degree of money laundering had taken place uh, among these people that were associated with Barry Seal. What had not been done was to connect the dotted lines to ADFA. Because once you connected the dotted lines to ADFA, you had actually connected the dotted line to Clinton. In addition to the operations at MENA, small clearings in other parts of the state were used as drop points for money and cocaine. They had special uh, uh, cargo doors installed in the side without FAA permission uh, so that these uh, doors could be opened in flight. They'd uh, pull in, slide back, and, and the cocaine could be dropped out of the side in flight. When you have a public which is aware of an ongoing criminal enterprise, which, when you have an international cocaine smuggler who is high profile, and a lot of people know that they are operating in a small area. A lot of people knew about the money laundering. Uh, it was common gossip on the street because it was so blatant. 
and they see investigations ongoing for several years, and they keep watching for indictments. They know grand juries are convening. They know that witnesses are supposed to be providing evidence to a grand jury, yet year after year after year, no indictments are returned. People lose confidence in the system. Clinton had integrated a number of corrupt cops, judges, and politicians into high-level positions to ensure the continued success of the drug smuggling, money laundering operations. All was going well until a fateful night in the fall of 1987. On August 22nd, 1987, Kevin had spent the night with his friend Don Henry. They left uh, Don's home around 12.30 or quarter to one uh, on the 23rd of August in early morning hours, and uh, the next thing we knew, they had been run over by a train. There seems to be a small airstrip in the area. There have been sightings and uh, reports of small airplanes flying very low with lights off in the area. I believe they saw something they shouldn't have seen. Three weeks later, their deaths were ruled accidental by the state medical examiner, Fami Malik, and um, we disagreed with that ruling uh, because we thought the evidence pointed to homicide. Uh, at that point, we had a lot of questions and no answers. Uh, and the facts didn't add up to what he was telling us, so we decided to get a second opinion and uh, met with resistance from all fronts, both with our local law enforcement, with the state crime lab, uh, with everybody that we turned to. Uh, we obtained court orders uh, we, requesting samples of everything that the crime lab had for a second opinion, and uh, Femi Malik um, uh, resisted court orders. Uh, he refused to obey them. Ultimately, it was proven that Don Henry had been stabbed in the back and Kevin Ives' skull had been crushed prior to the placement of their bodies on the railroad tracks. However, Malik stood by his ruling that the boys had simply fallen asleep on the tracks. Malik had been kept in office at the insistence of Governor Clinton for a number of years, despite vigorous public outcry to have him removed. As long as Malik's rulings pleased the governor's office or state police, they were left to stand, no matter how implausible. Malik's obvious lack of medical knowledge reached a pinnacle when he ruled that James Milam, who had been decapitated, had died of natural causes. Yet Clinton, who had the power to remove Malik from office, insisted he stay. There were allegations of tampering with evidence in murder cases. Uh, there were allegations of perjury in different cases. It didn't seem to matter what Malik did, Clinton uh, protected him. He made excuses such as he's overworked, uh, he's just stressed out, he's underpaid. Uh, they gave him a $14,000 raise, which was an insult uh, to my family as well as a lot of others in the state who um, to this day are struggling with asinine rulings in the deaths of children and other loved ones. I was outraged that protecting a political crony of Clinton's was more important than the fact that two young boys had been murdered. Dan Harmon was just a local attorney in, in the town of Benton, Arkansas. And uh, after Don Henry and Kevin Ives were killed and their bodies placed on the tracks and run over by a train, he approached Linda Ives and the Henry family about trying to help them. He's a manipulator. Gives a great closing argument in court. He's been trained for years to play the game. He knows how to do it. He's very good at it. Mr. Harmon can win your confidence, and make you think he's the greatest guy in the world. He did that to Linda Ives. He helped lead them down a path that absolutely led to nowhere on this case. I got involved in the case and immediately Harmon uh, tried to discredit me without even knowing me. Um, couldn't figure it out. I run across a young lady named Charlene Wilson who told a horror story that I didn't really believe at the time. 
So I started searching for evidence to substantiate just part of what she had said. Herman went ballistic. Uh, called, he threatened me, threatened Sheriff Pridgen, threatened Captain Gene Donham, the chief deputy. All because I talked to this one woman. The people at the track that night, to my knowledge, were Dan Harmon, Keith McCaskill, Larry Rochelle. I do know that the boys were watching the drop site, okay? And they got curious as to what was being dropped there. The fact is, we know who killed these kids. The whole reason this case has been slowed down, stopped, wherever we're at. They can't do anything with it as long as Clinton's in office because it tracks right back to Bill Clinton being involved in the cover-up. He took care of everybody that ever covered anything up in this case. Everybody got promoted. A number of people approached the police with information about Don and Kevin's murders and consequently were murdered themselves. Shortly before Keith McCaskill was murdered, he, he knew that he was fixing to be murdered. He told his family goodbye, he told his friends goodbye. Uh, the night of uh, elections in 1988, uh, he took two pennies out of his pocket and threw them on the bar there at the wagon wheel and said, if Jim Steed loses this election, my life isn't worth two cents. And he was murdered that night. Uh, Jeff Rhodes was a young man from Benton who uh, uh, was murdered in 1989. Um, shortly before his death, he made a phone call to his dad in Texas and told him he needed to get out of Benton, Arkansas, that uh, he felt he knew too much about the boys on the railroad tracks and uh, the death of Keith McCaskill. Uh, a couple of weeks later, Jeff was found dead. Uh, he'd been shot in the head. Uh, they'd attempted to cut off his head and hands and feet, set him on fire in a dump. A total of six people with information about the boys' murders were eventually murdered as well. well Gene Duffy was the head of the uh, 7th Judicial District Drug Task Force. She was leading a team of uh, narcotics investigators into a drug trail in Saline County that led her right straight to Dan Harmon. This information she shared with the 1990 Federal OSADEF team that was investigating and targeting corruption and drugs in Saline County in Central Arkansas. From her involvement in that, she was literally threatened, forced to leave the state of Arkansas and go into hiding. I had no idea just how dangerous certain elected officials thought me to be until a brutal media campaign was launched against me. For months, there were daily allegations of everything from misspending funds to ordering illegal arrests. Every attempt was made to keep me from running the drug task force. We were even shut down completely for several weeks during a bogus state police investigation. In spite of crippling disruptions, the task force was making significant discoveries about drug trafficking in central Arkansas some of which led to the very people who were conducting the massive media crusade against me. We discovered that drug trafficking in Arkansas was linked to government officials in frightening proportions. A great number of people came to me with testimony about astonishing criminal activity of very high-level public officials. Many were willing to testify before the federal grand jury. Robert Govar and Chuck Banks were the U.S. attorneys for the District of Arkansas at that time. I was subpoenaed to testify on behalf of the drug trafficking and the cartel, more or less is what it was, uh, that had to do with Dan Harmon and what I call company because there are a whole, uh, there's a whole bunch of them that are involved. I was asked quite in depth about the drug trafficking that went on with Dan Harmon, um, Mr. Clinton, Roger Clinton. Although there was an abundance of evidence and word kept reaching me from members of the grand jury that they were ready to indict, no indictments came. Mr. Govar also insisted that he was ready to prosecute at least two key figures, but the holdup was his boss, U.S. Attorney Chuck Banks 
who repeatedly delayed requests for indictments. Harmon had paid a visit to Chuck Banks, the U.S. District Attorney, who was in charge of that district. It's recorded, he signed in. He was there approximately 30 minutes, and up until that time, everything appeared to be running fine with the grand jury. Then, in November, Banks removed Govar from the case, and I was fired from the task force. From this point, the ordeal turned really ugly. In January 1991, one of the key targets of Govar's investigation, Dan Harmon, took office as the 7th Judicial District Prosecutor. Harmon immediately called a state grand jury to investigate the allegations against me. To avoid being jailed in Hot Spring County, which would have put me in serious danger, I left the state. In the meantime, Banks, who had taken over the federal investigation, attempted to give the appearance of carrying the investigation forward while systematically destroying it. He harassed witnesses, suppressed evidence, and finally announced in February of 1991 that the investigation had disclosed no credible witnesses or evidence against any public official. I received a phone call uh, and they told me that um, I had made a very big mistake and I was assured by the U.S. Attorney's Office that my name, that my, my testimony, that my statements that the people that were on that witness list would never, ever be revealed. Well, ha ha, you know, someone in the U.S. Attorney's Office had given Mr. Harmon a list of the effective witnesses, you know. Some of them witnesses over a period of time have came up dead and or missing or have never been heard of again. That don't give you a very good feeling. I'm scared of these people. I'm very scared of them. Guess who arrested her? Dan Harmon. The very guy that she says turned her on to drugs now has her arrested. Dan Harmon, he walked to me, handed me what was supposed to be a search warrant, and he said, bitch, excuse me for saying that, I told you if you ever, ever brought my name up or brought anything up, about the past dealings that we've had that I'd take you down. He said, you're going to prison. I'm going to put you in prison. He did. I'm here. I mean, I, I've watched second, third offense people walk around with probation on top of probation on top of probation. Not this lady. First time she's been arrested for drugs. They allege that they found in her home she gets 30 years. Sure, everybody ought to be able to see through this. This is a man that told Linda Iles for years, we're going to get to the bottom of your son's death. But yet when I start making progress, it looks like the people I talk to starts getting time in the penitentiary. Linda says it's business as usual in Saline County, justice as usual in Arkansas. There aren't any words in the English language that can describe how it makes you feel as a parent or as a citizen of Arkansas uh, to see what our officials um, are capable of doing. Um, you know, I think we were just kind of uh, naive, um, common, ordinary people. Got up and went to work every day and came home and went to bed uh, and assumed that everybody else did the same thing and tried to do what was right. And uh, I think Kevin's death has been uh, the rudest awakening that anybody could ever have uh, to see what really goes on. I can provide information that has tentacles to Governor Clinton's administration. It is apparent to me that a congressional investigation is the last hope, not only for the people of Arkansas, but for the people of our nation who are now vulnerable to the powers of a president who has left in his wake implications of illegal activities and serious improprieties.
Meanwhile, Welch and Duncan's investigation into the operation at Mina was about to derail. We'd been so busy investigating, just concentrating, focusing, that uh, it took a while to register that uh, nothing was going to happen. We could not understand what was happening. Neither Mr. Welch nor I were ever subpoenaed to testify before the grand jury and present massive amounts of evidence of wrongdoing by associates of Barry Seal. No indictments were ever returned against any of the individuals. And I can tell you there was extensive evidence. There definitely was, was some suppression of evidence and definitely a cover-up of an investigation. And somebody should be held accountable as to why that happened. Not one major cocaine bust was ever made in Arkansas out of Mena, Arkansas. Now imagine that, 10 years nearly in its running, never one truckload ever got caught. During the 1992 Attorney General's race in Arkansas, a member of Clinton's staff had approached Winston Bryant and had asked him to stay away from the MENA affair or the MENA matter. I've done quite a bit of investigation in the MENA uh, uh, Barry Seal case myself, and uh, uh, quite frankly, it is a federal problem. After um, Winston took office, Bill told me that uh, he was no longer allowed to discuss um, the MENA airport investigation from um, the Attorney General's office. Uh, the Attorney General's office uh, is not uh, like most Attorney General's offices across the country. We do not have the authority to convene a grand jury and initiate criminal prosecution. A lot of people have said that the MENA operation stopped in 1986 when Barry Seal was gunned down. It's not true. Uh, covert operations are still going on in MENA, Arkansas today. Now, if you stop and think, back when Bill Clinton was governor, he was asked about MENA. He said, well, well that's a federal problem. I'm, I'm not going to get involved in it. Well, he's not the governor of Arkansas anymore. It's the president of the United States. If we still have operations at MENA, Arkansas, this is his golden opportunity to take care of it. My question is, why doesn't he? I've always thought it was a wonderful thing to be able to serve your country uh, as a federal law enforcement agent. And for 15 years, I did not encounter anything like the corruption which I encountered after the MENA investigations began. President Clinton's verbal commitment to a war on drugs has been negated by his actions. During his first weeks in office, Clinton revoked random drug testing for White House staff members. He eliminated 121 positions at the Office of National Drug Control, and he appointed Jocelyn Elders as U.S. Surgeon General, despite her well-known desire to legalize drugs. One of Hillary's investments, under the direction of Tyson Foods counselor James Blair, netted almost $100,000 on an initial $1,000 investment on nearly impossible feet using legal methods. I can't read their minds or speculate, but I had absolutely no reason to believe that I got any favorable treatment. Coincidentally, Governor Clinton enacted a number of state regulations allowing Tyson Foods to grow into the largest industry in Arkansas. Don Tyson put in six, seven hundred thousand dollars all told in all of Bill Clinton's campaign. Guess what he got out of it? He got $10 million, guess from where? The Arkansas Development Finance Authority. And he never paid a dime for it. I had heard rumors of Don Tyson and his alleged uh, cocaine use and uh, distribution. And I went through the intelligence files and come up with enough that I thought was sufficient amount of evidence to launch an investigation on Mr. Tyson, out, simply out of the Arkansas State Police intelligence files, has been accumulated for years. A great deal of criminal investigation files were surfacing with Don Tyson's name mentioned in there as uh, being involved with some drug and narcotics uh, trafficking activities. 
So I interviewed some of the investigators who worked on the Tyson case. Most of them felt that Tyson should have been in, indicted, but uh, the investigations were always um, uh, sabotaged, uh, oftentimes from within. One particular uh, undercover narc agent told me that uh, uh, another criminal investigator in that department named Doug Fogley was furnishing Don Tyson with photographs of the undercover narcotics agents that were working on his case. Donald Smaltz was actually hired to look into the allegations that Tyson had given bribes to different people, specifically to the Secretary of Ag Agriculture, Mike Espy. And what came out of that investigation was very remarkable. Drug abuse, um, drug distribution, money laundering, even murder for hire. Now, Smaltz collected all this stuff. He compiled it, he put it in proper order. Then he approached Janet Reno and said, look, you know, I need to broaden my investigation. I'm finding more here than just simple payoffs. What do you think happened? Well, by now, most of you already know. He was turned down. Just exactly what we expected to happen, happened. I mean, Tyson already hired lobbyists, um, attorneys, who all approached Congress, trying to get everybody to stop Smaltz. Why is it in this country today that if you've got a little money, you walk away? Why is it you can create the pressure to stop investigations? And I promise you, Janet Reno has stopped this one. You look at these and you wonder, how could this happen? You know, how does someone elude prosecution with reams of investigative reports? How does it get stopped? Some say it's Bill Clinton. Don Tyson was in the middle of the cocaine just like Bill Clinton, just like Dan Lasseter, just like Roger Clinton, and all the others. So you see, all of this incest and all of this drug running all of the trafficking of drugs, sending them all over the nation, came out of Little Mina, Arkansas, right under the nose of little Governor Billy Clinton. I went to Bill, and I said, Bill, you've got two weeks to tell the truth, or I'm going to tell it. You're breaking the law, and I can't be a part of it. You made a mistake. I'm not one of your buds, or at least I'm not that big a buddy. When Larry Nichols made his disclosures made them public, the Clinton spin doctors treated him unmercifully. It shocked those of us who had been kept in the dark through the years in Arkansas politics. The Arkansas news media had done little, if anything, to uncover anything derogatory about Bill Clinton. And for these disclosures to come out of the blue was so shocking that the spin doctors attacked the messenger rather than tried to answer, tried to answer the charges that Nichols had made. And they did such an efficient job that it caused me and others to look was less in favor on Larry Nichols as an individual because all we knew about him was what they were telling and the press was printing. One of the neatest things about Bill Clinton is how he handles the media. You see, Bill Clinton's an attorney, and when a witness comes out against his client, what's the first thing an attorney does? He tries to discredit that witness. They accuse me of everything under the sun, day in, day out, every week. Every week, there was some new scandal in the paper that I was involved in. Six, eight weeks later, they print a retraction. It wasn't me. But to this day, people in Arkansas think that I'm some evil person. As a result of that, uh, the boy had to pay a high penalty in his credibility. He had to, had to pay a high penalty in his acceptability. And then when the new evidence came out that supported everything that Larry Nichols had said, 
he finds himself, I think, probably in the position of knowing that he had been exonerated, but he has not been exonerated in the minds of the people generally, in my view. And he finds himself probably in the position of wondering where he goes now to get his good name back. A lot of people wonder how Bill Clinton could control a state the size of Arkansas with the absolute authority that he did. It's not hard. You see, after 12 years, after kissing the people that have the money, Bill Clinton controlled the legal system. He controlled the judges. He controlled the attorneys. He controlled the banks. It's just a small state, a one-party state. What tends to happen in small states like that, I think, is the longer the person remains governor, that uh, I think the greater the abuses are. And uh, I think the abuses were very, very widespread under Bill Clinton. One thing that's very difficult for people to understand, Bill Clinton doesn't care about money. He cares about power. All he needed ADFA to do was to channel money to the big players financially. I got tickled when the reporters during the campaign came here. They were looking, trying to find out where Bill Clinton profited. He didn't. He profited by putting money into his friends' pockets. The way they were doing these bond issues and just the whole political atmosphere, quite frankly, uh, was a scandal. But that's the way things had historically been done in Arkansas. But imagine this, imagine the power this man has in Washington, D.C. Imagine what he can do to this nation if he gets that circle of power going there, as he did here. Nothing I can do, nothing you can do can stop it. Because he'll have the absolute power, and believe me, he will use it to have you investigated, to have you arrested, to have uh, your company audited. Now, that's what'll happen when his circle of power is complete. When I worked at ADFA, it was not uncommon for Bob Nash to call me up and say, hey, Nichols, the governor needs about five grand transferred to his travel account so he can go see his ladies. And we would at ADFA transfer five to $10,000 for him to go see his girlfriends in either LA or New York. He'd use so much travel money to go see women out of his regular travel budget, he would even have to borrow money from ADFA, not to mention the fact that ADFA's budget was not quite as scrutinized as the governor's budget. But he literally used money, ad for money, the people of Arkansas, taxpayers' money, to conduct liaisons. During the 1990 Arkansas gubernatorial race, Larry Nichols, in a last-ditch attempt to alert the public, boldly filed a lawsuit against Bill Clinton. As expected, the lawsuit was eventually quashed.